We will, I will be sending, certainly to, to the members of the academy, we will be sending out a letter. Yeah. But it's all also going to be on the academy website in the journal section. We have a section for the journal, so we will put there. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. For season three, we're actually doing live podcast interviews and I have the absolute pleasure here in Brussels at the European Rhinoplasty uh, course to have uh, the president of the EAFPS, Alvain D'Souza. Prof. Alvain, it's really nice to have you on this podcast again. Great pleasure to see you, Cameron, again, particularly face-to-face in Brussels. So, yeah, when so much has happened since you took over EAFPS. Um, so before we get into other things, how has it been for you? this journey over the last two years? It's not been easy. Having said that, we have achieved a lot. Why has it been easy? Mainly because I think we made our life difficult because we tried to pull the standards in terms of training and teaching and things like that. But I've had a fantastic group of people around me in the executive board and all the other uh, members have been so helpful. So I just like to say that I think we have come a long way since I took over and I'm I'm sure that we're on the right kind of direction. Yeah. So yes, it's been it's been great. I enjoyed it. That's yeah. Great. I mean, we in a in a couple of weeks' time, it's it's going to be a, a big meeting in Verona, and Dore was saying to me that there's a faculty of over two hundred speakers already. Absolutely. And what's interesting is Cameron that uh, we have people, surgeons who are very well established, actually saying to us, "Can we join your faculty?" Uh, that tells you something about yeah. what is happening. Yeah. And I think it's yeah. because we've been very open, we've been very democratic. We want the best talent to come to this meeting, to give lectures, yeah. and we are open. Yeah. Tell me, the other thing I want to know, how do you find time to balance everything in your life between the family, the practice, uh, the academics, the journal, the EAFPS, and then also going on holiday? <laughs> um, it's difficult. It's not easy. I think a lot of the time you are doing uh, basically, you know, on the move, kind of working on the move. But um, if you have a good team around you, yeah. it's quite helpful. And I'm very lucky. My family is very understanding. Um, and so it's not easy, but it's doable. That's great. I enjoy it. So, Owen, one of the things I'm very interested to chat to you about, you guys published a very interesting article about um, putting Botox in the nose at the same time of rhinoplasty to help with the entire recovery. How, now that it's been out there, I don't know if had any more feedback. Tell us a little bit more about that. Right. So first of all, the idea came from looking at scoliosis patients. Mm. I was with a very good physio who was looking at a scoliosis patient. And I heard him say that we want to weaken one side and strengthen the other side because the muscles go weak on one side and they're strong on the other side. And unless you work on that, no matter what you do with scoliosis, even postoperatively, they will they can bend back. And that's why they use these rods to fix everything. Yes. You know. So I thought, well, that tells me something. Yes. So I immediately thought that must be this case in deviated noses or what you call the scoliotic noses. Mm-hmm. So and then I thought, okay, let me try this then. So next time when I did a severely deviated nose, I used plenty of Botox, close to 100 units, on all the muscles around the nose. And I thought three, six months later, that nose stayed where it was. So that's how it worked. So then I, you know, I'm convinced as surgeons, and you know, we could speak to, we've been at meetings, we all talk about what grafts we put, how we stabilize, what we do. We don't talk about the muscles. You know, yes. And that small yes. area, the only way to splint it is to splint those muscles. And how do you splint the muscles? How do you change the muscle, if you like, myomodulation? And botulinum toxin is the one that came to my mind. And because I've had lots of experience over 25 years doing botulinum toxins, I thought this is the way to go. And believe you me, it really works. Wow. And as surgeons, I think it's important to understand that we got to look beyond just yeah. creating that architecture. You can create the architecture, you can create the good skeletal model underneath your nose, but the what pulls it in one direction or the other has to be controlled. 
That's absolutely. I find it very interesting. So, are you routinely doing it on rhinoplasties, or you're only doing it on rhinoplasties that there's some kind of a deviation? No. So, uh, I do it in patients who have deviated noses. In other words, when I feel that the muscle deviation is, you know, muscle is a significant factor. Okay. Uh, in other words, those patients who had major trauma, accidents, and things like that. Uh, I also do in patients when I put grafts, particularly in the radix. As you know, the radix grafts migrate quite a bit. Why do they migrate? Because of the procerus muscle. It pulls them. Yes. In a process, pulls it up to, you know, and, and you know that if you ask a, you know, rhinoplasty patient uh, to actually frown, they may not frown in the first 48 hours because the muscles are in a spasm, but a week later, they, they will frown. And two weeks later, they can frown even more. So what that tells you is the muscle, when it starts working, if you put grafts in there, yeah. unless you stabilize that muscle, and the only way to do it is to use botulinum toxin. It's a simple thing. So to answer your question, I do use it more and more. And I think in my practice, I'm probably not wrong to say it's almost becoming a standard of care. Now, even in mildly deviated noses. And then, okay, two questions around it. When do you inject it? And do you charge the patient this over and above the normal rhinoplasty fee or is it included in it? Uh, it's all included in it. And I inject it on the table when we, at the end of the operation. At the end of the operation. At the end of the operation. And I inject the procerus, I inject the corrugator muscles, I inject the nasalis fibers, and more importantly, I inject the levator labi superioris elikinase, and that's the muscle that runs across there. Yes. Because if you look at it carefully with your loops, in deviated noses, that muscle in some areas is quite prominent, in some areas it's not so prominent, so I inject all those muscle fibers. Uh, so. I don't have a specific way of injecting, but I just want to inject the whole of the nose all the way around and all the way around here. So what happens is those muscles just are paralyzed. I tell the patient, you, your lips may not move very well for a few weeks. Mm -hmm. You might not be able to frown or forehead may not move very well, mm -hmm. but patients accept that. Short-term pain for long-term gain. Absolutely. It's less than six weeks. So why do you inject it at the end and not at the start of the operation? Um, I think uh, there is no right or wrong here, mm -hmm. but I just find that if I inject it at the end, I put everything together, uh, I hope the Botox will work better rather than, mm -hmm. you know, when we inject at the start of the operation, we are washing quite a bit, we, you know, we are rinsing the nose, you know, we use the wash to, you know, rinse out the nose. So I just think you might be diluting mm -hmm. that area. So. Uh, but it's something that I will probably in the future look at. Mm. When she, what is the ideal time to inject? I'm not yet there. Right. It's fantastic. So, Alva, the other thing I'm really keen to just like ask about and chat about is the journal. How are things looking at the moment? Okay, so as you know, the journal, um, uh, we are two editors, and Anis Kefani, who looks after the North American wing, and I look out the rest of the world. I can certainly say, you know, Tony Scafani has been there longer than I have. And he said to me a few times that the number of articles that are coming to the journal from non-European or non-American uh, mm -hmm. uh, nation has gone up significantly. Okay. What that means is we are getting very high quality articles. Uh, and as you know, you know, each volume is like a monograph. So yeah. we get some fantastic people. And now we have actually some of the authors asking us, can we write a paper on my technique? And if, if it's the right one, we say yes, you know. So overall, I think the journal is doing really well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's a great journal. And all that I would say to you is if you have any papers, come and send it to us. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, okay. because it's it's something that I'm very passionate about. So the question I also have, so the, the amount of people who are submitting articles yeah. is increasing. Yeah. But what is the quality of those submissions like? Uh, the quality is some are very high quality submissions. Okay. Uh, like in any, for any journal, you know, I think we have a rejection rate of over 60%. Wow. Uh, you know, which means that, uh, and I think that is probably true for most journals. And any of us, you know, who've written articles for journals, you know, we pretty much know that the article might be rejected sometimes mm -hmm. no matter how good it is yeah um but what we try and do is um i try and give my um, um 
authors who submit to journals a pretty good feedback in terms of how they can improve the article. Okay. But, you know, as you know, we don't take case reports and things like that. Uh, so the quality is pretty good and it, and it keeps going up. So I think since we have taken over, I think the quality has certainly improved. Yeah, yeah. A lot, yeah. you know. So, um, and then in the next uh, few weeks to months, I'm actually planning to reshape the journal uh, editorial board. So I'm inviting people to actually uh, apply to be members of the editorial board rather than we just asking people. Wow. And that way, what we have is, and we will actually treat them as an advisory board so they can, then they review articles and so they can, you know, help me more. Yeah, that's so good. Eh? It's really teamwork. It's yeah, not yeah. one person. Well, guys, there you hear from from the horse's mouth. If you want to uh, apply, and remember, there's a rejection rate, but to to be an advisory board, that would be that's a great thing to do. That's so what, right. what must they Google to be able to do that? Uh, we will. Uh, I will be sending certainly to, to the members of the academy. We will be sending out a letter. Yeah. But it's all also going to be on the academy website in the journal section. We have a section for the journal, so we will. Put there as well. So make sure you go to EAFPS. Yeah, that's right, EAFPS.org. Uh, you will be there. Otherwise, just um, email me. My email is on the website or just email our secretary. I mean, there's one thing I do is uh, I try and attend to every single email and every single message yeah, I get. <laughs> it's usually just a one or two words, but I do it. Are you very good at that? Well, Alvin, thanks, man. It's really nice to catch up with you again. Excellent. Um, I'm very excited to go and operate on Monday and use Botox. I think it's going to be very interesting for me. And it's just great to know that the, the journal's on. It's up and up. Up and up. And Botox, try it. I, I, you know, 10 years from now, you'll tell me how to do it, you know, better. <laughs> uh, but try it and I and, and I think the message for everybody is that yeah. you know we got to think outside the box yeah absolutely well guys thank you so much eh? thanks for uh, tuning in to another episode we'll catch you next week and Alvin thank you very much for your time thank you thanks a lot for having me again Cameron. Cameron.